plane. Look. It's a plane. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superheroes have become a cultural phenomenon during their 70 plus years of existence. They have appeared in movies, TV, and radio programs, but they all got their start in comics. There are currently hundreds upon thousands of characters, but at one point in its existence, the entire comics industry was made almost completely devoid of stories that held mature content. The only stories printed by mainstream publishers were for children. The writers felt restricted in what they could write about and what they could include in their stories. The cause was a set of rules set up by the publishers themselves to avoid pressure from the government and a suspicious public. These rules were known as the Comics Code Authority. Comics were a large source of entertainment in the 1930s. While most were cartoonish and appeared in newspapers, some were starting to get their own magazine. Some were even oriented towards mature audiences, with stories and characters that could entertain adults. But in 1938, the industry was changed forever. Two young men, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, were looking for someone to print their new character, Superman. They finally found National Allied Publications, the company destined to become DC Comics. The company used Superman on the cover of Action Comics No. 1 in June 1938. The character was a hit and quickly gained popularity. NAP saw the money that could be made by introducing a new Superman and wanted one fast. The result was the debut of Bob Kane's Batman in Detective Comics No. 27 in May 1939. Once these two characters dominated the market, every publisher wanted their own superhero. Many are lost to time while some became as big a hit as Superman. Some notable heroes of this era were The Flash, Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, and Captain America. Not only were these heroes in the middle of their own fantastic adventures, they even started to help during World War II. Many of them helped to boost morale in the soldiers and alert kids to the threats they faced. Hitler himself insulted Superman when referring to an issue in which the Man of Tomorrow easily captured the Nazi leader. Even with all their success, there were some that saw them as a potential threat. Just like how many will argue TV's effect on a child is negative, many argued a similar effect from comics before television took off. One man in particular, Dr. Frederick Wortham, made his voice heard. Dr. Wortham was a psychologist who had graduated from the University of Wurzburg in 1921. He moved to the U.S. in 1922 and became a citizen in 1927. He later wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which was published in 1954. In his book, he argued that comics were a negative form of literature and a big cause of juvenile delinquency. He also claimed Batman and Robin operated as gay partners, Superman was a fascist, and Wonder Woman was a lesbian due to her strength. His book helped him portray comic books as negative influences despite the questionable evidence. The book shook the comics industry to the core when concerned parents became worried over their children's well-being. It wasn't long before the public wanted something to be done about the content within the books. In April and June of 1954, the United States Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency began their investigation of how comics could affect kids. Their main focus was crime comics, which featured crimes being committed and included superheroes, and horror comics, which showed graphic horror stories that were generally read by adults. With Dr. Wortham's book as evidence, it turned into a nightmare for publishers. Many writers were questioned whether the material in their books were appropriate. There was much debate over the subject. Reports of the case from papers just made things worse, making comics look like tools of corruption. Many publishers suffered, leading to the end of EC Comics, a company known for publishing mature stories. Before it could get any worse, all publishers agreed to have all future comics fit a new set of rules that they set up to get some of the pressure off themselves. The result was the Comics Code Authority. The CCA had a strict set of rules that had to be followed in order for a book to gain approval. While it wasn't mandatory, most companies wanted to look safe for younger readers. Dr. Wortham and his allies came out victorious. Any book that wanted to be sold would have to be approved first. The main rules were 1. Criminals can never win, and justice must always win out with the hero on top. 2. You cannot have the words terror or horror in the title, and gore is unacceptable. The Walking Dead, Torture, Vampires and Vampirism, Ghouls, Cannibalism, and Werewolfism are prohibited. 3. You must use clean language. While slang was not restricted, it was discouraged. 4. There is no form of nudity whatsoever. 5. Respect for parents and the importance of marriage in romance situations should be heavily mentioned. 6. Advertisements must be clean. By the end of the Golden Age, the heroes weren't doing well. Most had slowly disappeared over time, and the horror comics had taken a large part of the market with them when they were wiped out. At the end of the Golden Age, the only superheroes that survived were Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Once in a while, after superheroes went out of style, someone would try to revive them, but none were successful. At least they weren't until they decided to revamp an old legend. 
In showcase number 4, DC Comics decided to bring back The Flash. Unlike the past version, he had a more sci-fi origin, and was complete with a brand new identity and costume. He was a great success. This led to the revival of Green Lantern and others. Eventually, heroes were back in action, while still heavily censored by the CCA. This heavy censoring of content within the books limited the writers to very basic, childish stories. All the books were also very lighthearted. Batman was no longer a dark knight, but a cape crusader with catchphrases and improbable gadgets, which was reflected in his show. Hand me down the shark repellent bat spray! The remnants of suction of the innocent were still there too. Many parents still felt the books were unsafe, and many had to hide their books from their parents. Immature comic stories in the Silver Age were self-published underground comics made by people trying to get their voice heard, but eventually there was a sign of resistance in the 1960s. A newer publisher, Marvel Comics, had a secret weapon, and his name was Stan Lee. In Amazing Fantasy number 15, he and Steve Ditko introduced Spider-Man, a new kind of hero. Instead of being high and mighty, he was a simple teenager with conventional problems that someone his age had, on top of having to fight the occasional supervillain. Later, Stan and Jack Kirby created the Incredible Hulk. The code stated that the army must always be portrayed as the good guys, yet in every issue, the Hulk was pursued by the US Army. The army's goal was to capture or kill the Hulk, which is not in any way heroic. The publishers explained this by saying they were simply misinformed. Even so, it was clear who the good guy was and who wasn't. But the real game changer was The Amazing Spider-Man number 96, when it was published without code approval. The story centered on drugs, a touchy subject. In the story arc, Peter Parker's best friend, Harry Osborn, became an addict to pills. The CCA refused to accept it, and the comics were published for three months without approval. Those issues sold very well and prompted the first revision of the code since its creation. It became much looser and allowed for many different topics to be discussed and taught to kids. The writers were finally able to beat the code by slowly bringing in more and more mature content through the years and eventually freed themselves from being heavily censored. Now they could make the books they always wanted to. After the change in the code, writers felt there was room for more mature material. In 1970, the year the Silver Age ended, Green Lantern and Green Arrow went on a trip across America to see the sights and tackle social issues. In Green Lantern, Green Arrow, number 76, they talked about racism when Green Lantern was approached by an African American with the question that if he's done so much for the multicolored skin aliens, why hasn't he helped the black skins on Earth? The most famous story, which spanned number 85 and 86, was Snowbirds Don't Fly. In the story arc, Green Arrow's sidekick, Speedy, became addicted to heroin and it showed what it was like to be a junkie. It was the first time a drug being used was referred to by name. The original code would not have approved of this. The maturity of the stories continued to rise in the late 70s and 80s. The Dark Knight Returns brought Batman back to his roots while telling the tale of an aging Bruce Wayne in a corrupt world where Superman was the government's puppet. Tony Stark, aka Iron Man, was shown to have an extreme drinking problem in the storyline Demon in a Bottle. Throughout the story, he fought his alcohol addiction while still trying to continue his career as Iron Man. These stories showed how the code was losing its grip and no longer had anywhere near the power it once possessed. Today, the Comics Code Authority is no more. In 2001, Marvel Comics dumped the code in favor of their own rating system. Over the next decade, use of the code continued to plummet. In January of 2011, DC Comics announced that they would abandon the code and adopt a rating system similar to Marvel's. One month later, the last company using the code, Archie Comics, announced that they would drop it as well. This led to the ultimate death of the CCA, leaving only a long history of censorship represented by hundreds of old comics with its stamp of approval.